our craft is money, right? Whether it's mobile homes, whether it's lending, it's learning as much as we can about financial education, learning how to market, learning how to find great deals, learning how to negotiate, learning how to talk to people and communicate with people. There's so much opportunity here, but the private money part is literally money. If you're thinking about lending, you gotta make sure that you're asking the right questions. Like you're vetting not just the deal, but you're also vetting the person that's gonna be the operator, the person that essentially that you're lending the money to. This is the best time, in my opinion, to invest. And so many investors are unloading stuff right now because they're panicked. So there's such great opportunity. All right, welcome everybody to another week, another wealth webinar where we are literally going to teach all of you some really cool things all about money, all about you being your own bank, and all about you taking back control of your money. And today I'm really honored to have Christy and Noah on because what we're going to talk about is opportunities, opportunities, and the how to's. So we're going to do this in an interview style. They came to the three day event where we had almost, actually, we had 195 people at our three-day virtual training this past weekend. And the third day of the training, what we did is we literally went rapid fire for opportunities. And the coolest thing about this dynamic duo right here, Christy and Noah, is, you know, Noah is, you know, he's in real estate, actually doing it day in and day out, crushing it. But he's also the coach for Private Money Club, teaches all the folks and the members of Private Money Club how to actually do deals the right way. And the coolest thing is, is it doesn't matter if you're a borrower or a lender, he teaches both sides of that coin. People with money learn how to make their money go to work for them and be safe about it without having excessive risk by not knowing what they're doing. That's the biggest risk. Like most people, when they talk about, no, oh, I, I wanna lend, but I just don't know. It sounds risky. I just, I don't know what to do. Well, great. Get with Noah, take part in the accelerator program. And by the way, folks, the next one is Monday. So we got the next accelerator coaching class starting Monday. So shameless plug, any of you throughout today, I figured I'd, why wait till the end? Let's just get it right out. You all should enroll into that and we'll make it worth your while today. We got a training course starting on Monday and I think every single one of you should be there. Now, you don't have to agree, but we can agree to disagree whether you're like, I don't know if I should be there Monday, but I think you should because you could find out how you can be your own bank, how you can be a lender or a borrower and you can make a ton of money without all, all the risks of the stock market. How, how's everybody feeling about the stock market? The Fifth Bank went uh, defunct. The FDIC had to take receivership of Citizens Bank. Okay, so that's five. Just this year alone. I mean, hey, we're not keeping track in the past. So the stock market is being held up by seven stocks, the Magnificent Seven. That should make you feel good because there's 500 stocks in the S&P 500. And, and seven of them are the only reason it's positive. That should feel great. Oh, uh, Citigroup, uh, what are they calling that? Bora Bora, they're going to lay off 10% uh, of their workforce. Stephen, how many is that? Is it like 10, 20,000 people, 23,000 people? 24,000. Oh, I, I was undershooting it. See, I always like to underdeliver and overpromise. So only 24,000 people are about to get their papers saying, hey, it was nice knowing you, but we're sending you to Bora Bora, and this isn't a vacation. This is your final day here. Why do they call it Bora Bora? Like, when I say Bora Bora, what's everybody think? Don't you think of that place where you go and you sit on the beach, you know, sipping Mai Tais and like just doing cool stuff on the beach? You don't think about getting your walk-in papers. It, and listen, I'm not saying that's a good thing and I'm not trying to point fun on this, but like this is the reality. Companies are not doing well. Future earning reports are coming out somber if, if, at best. Even Apple is disappointing. Like, Every, the only one who seems to be doing anything like in terms of like growth are the Magnificent Seven. Apple's one of them and Apple disappointed. But Microsoft, oh, are they ever answering? Oh, they got AI. Yeah, yeah, it's the AI. It's all speculation, smoke and mirrors, house of cards, whatever you want to call it. So folks, today we're going to get into things that don't involve house of cards, that don't involve speculations. We're going to talk about real deal, tangible assets and how you can be the bank and lend on them, or you can raise money for your next project that you're going to do. And that's what Noah's going to teach you is the proper ways to do both of those. So Stephen, in the chat, if you can put that link, because, hey, I hate wasting any good time. And I know these folks all want to click the button and get enrolled, but they probably are like, well, well, hold on. You said I'm going to have some cool stuff. That's right. Just 
stay on pause, you know, just keep your finger on the trigger because we're going to give you some really cool things to enroll. But I figure before you enroll, because I know everybody's ready to do it, you should probably learn who your instructor is going to be and learn some of the opportunities that you can take part in immediately after you're done with the accelerator coaching. All right. I probably went too long on that one, but let's, uh, let's just <laughs> dive right into this thing. So how are you guys doing today? What's up, Chris, man? We are, we, you're on fire, man. You, you just, you're coming at us. You're the one on the accelerator right now. I love it, man. You're fired up. And <laughs> we're just happy to be here. Um, just a day in the life, you know, and you, you said it best, like in the video that you were playing before here, you probably mentioned the word pivot like five or six times. And, um, you know, this morning, Chris and I spent the morning checking in on projects, outlining our 2024 marketing plan for our real estate investing business having conversations with more lenders and just getting ready, you know? And when you use that word pivot, it's like, we're, we're actually kind of excited with the real estate market. Cause there's a lot of things that we've been doing that we feel like now we we've done a lot of work to put ourselves in a good position to um, thrive when others might be uh, trying to figure it out. And it's not too late. Like there's things that we're going to talk about today, things that Christy and I, uh, specialize in and really enjoy investing in and learning more about and helping others learn more about that. I feel like we can accelerate a person's success. We can accelerate a person's outcome. You know, if they want to put their money to work in something different, if they want to get into real estate investing and they're like, is now the right time? How do I get started? Interest rates are so high. We look at this with the complete opposite type of lens like we have these these lenses on right now that are like wow okay these these are the opportunities where this is going to set up just not ourselves and our kids but you know our kids kids you know what i mean and we're excited to be talking about some of those things here today yeah and we're seeing so many investors that do real estate that came in maybe at the COVID time that are like panic now oh no it's happening interest rates are high and i'm looking at it like this is great this is our time to shine because we've been investing for so long we've seen the ups and downs and this is the best time, in my opinion, to invest. And so many investors are unloading stuff right now because they're panicked. So there's such great opportunity. You know, I think there's an interesting take on that. Now, out of the audience, you know, we got 133 people. That is freaking awesome. Steven, check those numbers out, man. I just got to yeah. give some props to all these folks who are on here. Like every week we do this and every week we got like 100 to 150 people who show up and always a bunch of new people. So Thank you to every single one of you for your time, your energy, and your effort to learn something new. Just wanted to make sure I gave props for props. More important than ever, too. So I'm, I'm super happy for everyone. I mean, the timing couldn't be better. It's the last coaching class uh, we have with Noah for this year, for 2023. Um, and, and the timing with everything going on with the economy and the markets couldn't be better to learn how to control your wealth and to deploy that, keep that growing consistently um, into this coming year and in, into the future. And that's how you build wet wealth through consistent returns, reduce risk. And that's exactly what all this is about today. Yeah. yeah. The whole three day was about mitigating risk. And we're going to continue on that theme because I mean, we're really trying to strip as much risk out as possible, but look at the opportunities that lie ahead and actually right in front of our face, given the market conditions. I mean, everybody knows the fed's been raising rates, which has really pinched a lot of real estate investors. It's pinching syndicators big time right now. And a lot of people are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place, but they're not at a point of pain yet where you're hearing them squeal, but it's coming. And actually, I know the two of you are definitely seeing that. And I know I see it because Stephen, myself, Shauna, both of you, we go to masterminds all over the country all the time. And I got a couple of masterminds I go to where it's a lot of wholesalers. Do we have any wholesalers on here? Uh, anyone that's just wholesaling properties? If you're a wholesaler, just put WL in the chat. I know a lot of wholesalers are struggling right now. You know, the times were so good for wholesalers for so many years that literally it just got to be almost just like, you know, it's too good to be true. They were just printing money wholesaling. But then all of a sudden, a lot of the iBuyers started slowing down. They stopped buying because they started either figuring it out themselves or they just realized like Zillow, like, hey, we're losing our ass here. We're overpaying for properties. And now the price of the properties are going down. Uh-oh, stop all of that. So a lot of the wholesalers had some troubles. And, and now wholesalers are still getting deals, but they're having to basically sometimes not keep the good ones and they're having to offload them, which really presents an awesome opportunity for the two of you in what you're doing. Here's what I love. Number one, location, location, location. And you guys are in an awesome location where your business is. 
and it's a location of number one, pricing is not out of control. Number two, people want to be there, unlike Buffalo, New York, where people don't want to be here. Matter of fact, let me pivot real quick. You guys are going to kick out of this. So I've got a complex trust structure that's all set up. And I, I always like doing due diligence on things. So I hired this really awesome, high-powered CPA consultant to review my entire structure. And he sent back the review of it all. And you know, I'm not going to get into it, but it was like all this good stuff and all these recommendations. You know what the CPA's number one recommendation to me was? Move, Move. out of New York State. <laughs> Swear to God, this, this high-powered CPA consultant, his number one thing is the best advice I can give you is get out of New York. You'll save a ton of money in taxes. Anyway, uh, I digress on that. But you guys don't live in an area like that. And the other thing that I love about your model is the type of properties. And I'm hoping that maybe you can kind of talk about them and show them. But, you know, I know, Christy, you do a lot with mobile homes. And the best part about mobile homes is there ain't nothing sexy about a mobile home park, right? Or a mobile home for that matter. Now, I might be very different than the audience. I grew up, my grandparents, uh, you know, Tom and Teresa, my dad's parents, they lived in a mobile home. So my entire upbringing, I was riding my BMX. My friends lived in that mobile home park. Like to me, it was the best thing ever. Like hundreds and hundreds of homes, lots of kids. And we just rode our bikes around terrorizing everything. It was the freaking greatest thing. But yeah. I never really looked at it back then as like, wow, every one of these mobile homes would make a really good opportunity. I could make some money. But that's how you look at it. And the cool thing about the mobile homes is because they're not sexy, there's not a lot of people chomping at the bit. And not only that, the way you're doing it, I think is just wild. So I don't know where we want to start, but you know, like if mobile homes are a really good investment, hopefully you'll have some opportunities for the 136 folks on here. It's actually more than that, actually. I've undershot it. 139 folks on here. Okay. But not only that, then Noah with his accelerator coaching can teach all of them literally how to safely get involved with the mobile home parks or any of these opportunities. So where should we start? We're talking about the market and kind of like how you got into mobile manufactured homes. Cause we do a lot of manufactured homes, but it, it seems like a lot of the mobile home manufactured home deals come across our desk and we know what to do with them. Whereas a lot of other investors might pass up those types of opportunities. And Christie's really developed a niche for it. Yeah, there's just so many weird nuances and, and rules and regulations locally behind them. So I think a lot of people, one, steer clear because every time you turn on the news, there's a mobile home park that's been blown. I always say this, but it's it's comical. It's blown away by a hurricane, a tornado, you know, and then the myth is they don't appreciate then it's like you can't get insurance. So instead of everybody really researching and finding out these things, they just listen to everyone and say, oh, they're terrible investments. I'm just not going to do them. And that's been the stigma since I got into them in, since 2007. And you're seeing this uptick of investors now buying them for, you know, buy and hold for cash flow, wholesaling them, rehabbing them and selling them. Because you're seeing that there's a lot of baby boomers that are downsizing and saying, listen, we don't want to you know, $5 million home. We actually would like an affordable home. We've retired, we have all this retirement money and we actually want to travel, but we want to have a home base somewhere. So we're finding even affordable housing for people renting, right? Section eight, you can do it all with the manufactured homes. So I have been doing this since 2007. And just recently, um, we just saw a fellow investor we've known for years out, out of New York. He just actually bought a mobile home in a park and he was so excited about it. And I'm like, dude, finally, I've been telling you this for like, you know, 10 years. What are you doing? He's from New York City. too. Yeah, he's yeah. from New York City. So he buys an upstate and all around or, you know, in Pennsylvania. So it's just kind of funny. But what it's created is this affordable housing that's always been there but now people are realizing these places can actually be nice they don't have to be a trailer they don't have to be low income and just you know in an awful area that was the stigma um you know if you drove through arizona florida you would see oh these homes are beautiful they're in retirement communities but when you get outside of those states a lot of ours aren't 55 and older they're just regular living but it's created this great opportunity because people that own them are motivated to get rid of them because a lot of people don't want them or maybe you know they don't want to pay the lot rent in the park so we're able to buy the homes at a discount maybe they've owned a mobile home on land for many years their mother and father lived in they passed away they don't want it anymore and they sell it for a discount so we've been picking up every variety even if you have a piece of land someone wants to sell guess what if it's in an area where you can develop that land you can put mobile homes on that land so it just is an opportunity that there's so many areas you can invest in, which is what I love. 
I love that uh, one that you showed on the three day where it was like this actually beautiful freaking house, palm trees, in ground pool. And, and on another, well, it was all one parcel, but over on the other side, like if you look at an aerial view, what you had is you actually had a mobile home over there. And they, they were having a hard time selling the property because nobody could get financing because the banks wouldn't finance a mobile home. So you're just like, oh my gosh, I got this figured out. Let's just split the, why they didn't think about this, but hey, you know, sometimes people just don't take the time to know. Divorce. That's yeah. why they didn't think about oh. it. They said, we just don't even want this thing. We're just done. And and to tell you, the, the female, the lady was remarried to a GC. And when we made our low offer based upon everything, he said, well, it really wouldn't cost them much to fix it up. And my agent said, well, you should drive down from Charlotte and fix it up. And they said, no, we're just going to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, motivation, right? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you just split it down the middle and you said, hey, this one now can be sold, you know, for a, a decent profit. But even if you didn't sell it for much of a profit, if you just got what you paid for, it it wouldn't matter because now it's a financeable property. It's gone speed. And then you got this this mobile home over here, which you can fix up, put a little buck into. And that's like pure freaking profit. Like so simple, like no. It is. And there's so many deals out there like that. You wouldn't realize that, you know, and, and we've encountered this before, even one that needed to sell quick. An agent came to me a week before closing. Oh my gosh, we didn't know that the buyer can't get financed because this old mobile home that we originally lived in is still on the property. So we've got mobile homes for free that we can move off the land and take and resell or wholesale. So it's just this weird thing most people have no clue about. And, you know, agents are now learning because they're getting more properties like that, because a lot of these are people that are older that initially owned the land, lived in the mobile home for cheap, then built their dream home after. Right. And now they want to sell it. But they're in a position that they're like, this is too many moving pieces for me. I'm just an agent. I just list and sell. I don't know what to do. And I look at something like that. Let's just say a wholesaler or an agent sent me that deal. I immediately would have looked at it and been like, nah but you guys look at it through a different lens. And the beauty is, is, you know, there's only two people. There's people with money and people that need money. And, you know, all this does is bring it together because now you got this great opportunity. You know what to do with it, but you need the money to buy that property quick. So, <laughs> so someone like myself or Steven or Greg Nagy, as he mentioned on there, we basically just become the bank and we just lend the money. We we get the best of everything. I don't know why everybody isn't just the bank because honestly, I think we're, I think we just cheat. I truly do. I think it's too easy. We just find people like you that know where these deals are. You go out and do the hard work. You go out and drive the properties, deal with the dogs and the dog poop and the cow poop. Maybe not, but anyway, my mind. <laughs> the snakes, deal, the snakes. All the snakes. <laughs> I don't want nothing to do with You guys got snakes down there? Oh, there was a snake at the manufactured home. My lady that renovates and, and demos, she's like, oh, look what I found. I was like, oh, I will not be coming down there. Just kill that thing, please. <laughs> Perfect. I know they're good. I know they kill and pests. I know that. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. So like, I mean, think about it, guys. Those of you that are in real estate now, how many times have you had a lead come across your desk where it was a mobile home or there was a mobile home on the property and you're like, you just dismissed it, you know, and we make just as much on our manufactured and mobile home deals as we do in a lot of our single family properties. And the rehab time is uh, by far less no permits the, the rehab cost is by far less um so don't di don't dismiss these manufacturer these mobile home leads and you know we're talking about a deal on land right now that w w came with a house but like there's also deals to be had where the land isn't even involved where you're just buying the individual manufactured home or the individual mobile home and rent and paying lot rent and you can flip them in parks so there's so much opportunity here and but the private money part is is literally money you know because you a lots of times you could a person couldn't do these types of deals unless they had all the all the cash to do it them do it themselves because the financing just isn't going to happen traditionally or conventionally so or even hard money lenders there's a lot of hard money lenders um that aren't going to fund these types of properties yeah there's i think so, locally one hard money lender now that will list on a manufactured home attached and detitled to the ground but outside of them so not many. every everything that we do is with private money and our last this project we're talking about right now is funded with uh, a lender that we've met through the private money club and like you said they're super they're so excited we're doing all the work we're finding the properties 
They're making a great rate of return. And Which she was really excited because yeah. we, we always send our lenders updates on the property. You know, some of them have been with us for years and don't care. They're like, thanks for the picture, whatever. We have an internal Facebook page that we have for each of our lenders so they can see what's going on. And we sent her a video and she said, oh my gosh, you're like halfway done with the property and you've had it two weeks. She's like, that would never happen in my area. You know, cause she's like, that's why I don't want to rehab. I just want to lend. So it was really cool to see. I got to say this, like, I, I'm just going to show everybody on private money club. I'm on here today and I'm just looking at this and it is just posted literally at 10 35 AM. Uh, so this is one of the members of private money club in the forum. If retail is dead, how does wholesale deals make sense when rates are over 8%? The retail is dead. We have come, we have to completely change our strategy as 80% of potential buyers are no longer shopping or able to afford anything over 250,000. So I'm just going to leave that right there. And Noah and Christy, what is the first thing you would say to that individual? Because this is this is so on topic. I, I didn't plan that. I literally just looked up and there it was. So like this is a wholesaler, it sounds like, who's saying, you know, I'm having a hard time wholesaling deals because rates are over 8%. But now he knows about this thing called Private Money Club. Like the deals aren't dead. They're just now maybe your deals, right? You know, I'm not trying to put anyone down or anything like this, but, you know, Education is key. I saw it in the chat box. How is it that this person is saying everything's going kaput and here we are saying, you know, we're just like, we're rubbing our hands. We're like, we can't wait for everything to go down. I would say to that person, you know, how good are your deals? How good are your, is your negotiating? You know, one of the things I, I think is the, one of the most valuable aspects of what Christy and I do in our respective coaching classes, whether you're learning about mobile home investing and lending on mobile home deals or learning private money club or learning how to borrow and, and, and lend money with me is learning how to market, learning how to find great deals, learning how to negotiate, learning how to talk to people and communicate with people that uh, creates win-win outcomes for everyone, you know? And then at the same time, the time to build up your private money lender database is right now it's before you go and get a deal or something comes across your desk like you don't want to be scrambling so as much as a person is starting to market is is learning how and implementing strategies for marketing for deals whether it's mobile homes or single families or whatever you're marketing for opportunities but at the same time you guys log into private money club and start marketing for lenders and if you're lending start marketing for borrowers Right. We want to have these relationships lined up. We want we want to have people around the corner waiting in line to do deals with us so that when we have a property under contract, we can send it over to them. So I think education is the key with something like that. I don't want to say I'm trying to find the right word. It's not a, it's not like the mindset. Like what kind of mindset is that? Like instead of saying, what can I do to go out there and find great deals and build great, great relationships with lenders? It's like, you it's know. just really discounting everything. Yeah. And I think like on the wholesale side, and I've seen this like over the many years we've been in real estate, you know, there's so much education out there quickly you can find on YouTube, but it's not thorough. So when a, someone's learning to wholesale, what I found with a lot of people, and, and I've kind of made some of these people like my partners, because I would find a wholesaler that could definitely find a property, just was not good at negotiating and also terrible at assessing repairs. And the whole point of wholesaling is you need to know your repair estimate number. So when you're getting these deals, like I'm seeing them right now, guys, through my email, because I don't even know, like I haven't even subscribed to all these local wholesalers, but I'm getting wholesale like deals constantly all day. And I look at them and I immediately, because we rehab, no, there's no way this is a $25,000 rehab. This is easily a 40 to 45. And I know that from doing this business and knowing my price per square foot. So I think what happens is it, it seems dead because some of these deals aren't negotiated properly. The repairs are ridiculous and the ARV, they're still going with what was happening 2020 COVID. We're back into a cycle pre-COVID now, right? We're, we know our market, we know our whole time. Like people are panicking because deals aren't selling in one day anymore. Some are still, but I'm like, guys, go back four years, five years ago, and everything took in our market 45 to 60 days. That's average. So it's not weird. Things are sitting that same amount of time now. So I think, again, like Noah said, it's educating and just knowing what the heck you're doing. Yeah, running your numbers. You got to figure out, hey, what's the, you know, the person that is going to buy this house for me after I fix it up and flip it? You know what what is that going to look like for them and you address that on the front end and i kind of chuckle chris because when people say when you see on the news interest rates or this interest rates or that 
I mean, we have a deal right now. We're paying 14%. We pay anywhere from eight to 12 on average regularly. I mean, for years we've been paying double digit rates of returns, uh, interest to our lenders. So, um, you know, interest rate doesn't really bother me so much. I guess that's just kind of how I've been well, and if you program. talk to any long term investor, a lot of what we are buying now is from baby boomers and a lot of them bought when interest rates were very high. Like my father's one of those. He bought land. He was a farmer. He's like the first farm I bought. I paid 16 percent interest. He just sold that farm for millions of dollars. Right. He's held it that long because because he farmed on it. So in my mind, I'm like, this obviously all works. People have been doing this. You just need to know what you're doing is the key education. Well, I think that'll bring us to the next part of this this interview. And, you know, I think Tammy uh, gave us a great chat uh, that I think kind of can guide this next. She said, this is great, yet is it the, just a conversation explaining the opportunities or is there some education and step-by-step -step on how to do this? So maybe what we can do is talk about one of your deals real quick. And, you know, I can kind of just draw on the board and then we'll show the board big when I'm done. And maybe the two of you can kind of just go back and forth. Like, Christy, if you've got a deal, we can kind of put the numbers up and then, you know, Noah, you can say, here's how I might underwrite this deal as a lender. Here are some of the things I'd look at. And then Christy, you could say, here's how I would basically position this to the 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 borrower or sorry, the lender on the other side. I, I think that would kind of be fun. Are you up to that? Yeah, For let's sure. do it. Completely okay. unrehearsed, folks. But I mean, hey, we're just yeah. taking. Tammy let's do the one we're talking about since that's the one we're talking about. And heck yeah, a project that we are currently renovating. Our goal was to have it ready for market November 15th. So next week. And um, so this is a house, this is a motivated seller, you guys. And one, th one of the things that we've done a really great job at, becoming known in our community with agents as people that they can turn to that will buy houses that are kind of funky, that have weird situations going on, you know, that, that would be great as like an investor uh, to purchase something that, uh, retail home buyer probably wouldn't be able to yeah and we love purchase. agents bringing us things like i want every time a good agent in our area has a deal that they take a retail client into and they go this could be a really awesome house but it's not for my retail client how could i make this great okay let me call Noah and christy so i don't have to constantly search the mls i have agents finding and bringing us deals which is so key because that's you know there are a lot of deals on the mls i hear that all the time too there's no good deals on the mls but they're everywhere cool so this is actually you guys that are tuning in for the first time like this is actually i presented this opportunity to private money club and some of these numbers are different because I, I initially, we got the property under contract and then I started, okay, let me see who wants to fund this. This is a fun one for private money club. So some of these numbers, we actually ended up negotiating the price down a little bit more, which is kind of cool. So, okay. So this house was listed on the MLS for anyone to buy with a house and manufactured home for 315,000. Okay. Now I know from pulling comps and working with the agent that I have that if these, the, now again, these were on the same parcel, same tax ID number, same tax bill, same parcel. Um, what we also found out later, the manufactured home is not detitled. At the time, it was not detitled. So it still had a title. Even though it was on land, it was not truly attached to land. It is just sitting there. So it had like a DMV vehicle motor title to it, which means that I would have had difficulty getting financing on that because A, it was on the same parcel as the house. We couldn't get any traditional financing and B, because the mobile home was not detitled. Um, and that might sound like pretty simple, but that's a very important piece to this puzzle that, you know, if you're, if you're going to be investing or lending on mobile home deals, make sure you get with Christy to talk about how to make sure that it's detitled and what that paperwork process might look like, because uh, as, as you'll find out here in a minute, it changes our buying pool significantly. So the house, beautiful backyard, pool, palm trees, like looks like a Florida home. I mean, gorgeous, like well-kept house. A couple had gotten divorced many years ago. This was their last asset tying each other together. I have no clue. It was not a great divorce. I have no idea why they just let this thing go <laughs> um, prior to. But this was like the last piece of holding them together. So we knew there was motivation. My agent actually had her retail buyer come look at this property. This is an area called St. Matthews. It's about 28 minutes from downtown Columbia. It's a little more rural, closer to Orangeburg on the way to Charleston. So great, great area if you want to live out of the outskirts. Um, and it was on, it's on two acres, okay? So one parcel, two acres, a manufactured home and house. So I went in and ran kind of my comps on everything. 
the house alone comped out at 350,000. So we knew the house was worth 350. So I was like, okay, cool. I feel good about that. It really didn't need that much work. And I'll tell you exactly where we're at now, like on renovation wise. So we ended up yeah. buying the house though for 250. Oh yes, I'm sorry. So we went back and negotiated down once to like 290. And what en ended up happening, 290 would have still been good. It still would have made sense. However, I started picking apart the manufactured home and I said, well, listen, it hasn't been detitled. Not only had it not been detitled, I asked um, her to ask the seller, has this house been moved from its original land? Because I knew for some reason this house had not originally been put there. And the seller says, oh my gosh, she's right. I forgot. In 2006, we actually bought this manufactured home at a repo lot. So somebody had let their house foreclose, the repo lot took it, and we bought it for a discount from the repo lot. What that meant to me is now, even though my goal was to subdivide the parcel, right, give the house an acre and a half and give the manufacturer a 0.5 acre to have two separate tax numbers and detitle the manufactured home so it's truly now a piece of real property, because it had been moved twice, I can only get VA financing or a cash buyer. It is not open for conventional or FHA financing. Nobody would have ever known that unless you dealt with mobile homes. So truly, if someone had bought this based on higher numbers, they would have gotten themselves, they would have made some money, but could have gotten themselves in a bad bind because now you're only dealing with two types of buyers, VA or uh, cash. Yeah. So we ended up picking up the house and the mobile home together for 250 grand. Okay, so what was cool about that was like, whoa, massive discount because the manufactured home is worth about 120,000. All right, you caught up there. And, it, and then with our rehab, when we were initially, again, this, these are our initial numbers as I was presenting to the private money club before we went back and uh, ne ne renegotiated the price. Um, we thought, okay, great. If we're going to get this for 275, then the max that we're going to put into this property is 25,000. So being that we got it at 250, we decided to go above and beyond with the renovation. And we did things we weren't initially planning on doing just to make sure again, in this marketplace, we want to make sure when someone walks through our properties, the jaw drops to the floor. There's, there's everything is absolutely perfect. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. I want to write an offer on this house, right? So right now what uh, our rehab budget on this is? So on the house, um, we are at $41,624.82 to be exact. <laughs> my spreadsheet pulled up. Um, and that's where we're at. We're done. Like we're, we're wrapping up. We'll be done in the next week. They're finishing out stuff. On the manufactured home, we actually ended up putting in 28000 888.56. So $28,888.56. And that's the final number. So we know that with listing the house, that will go fast. There is nothing, when I tell you nothing on the market in that area right now that is redone and nothing in the market that is nice with a pool. So I, I feel very strongly this will go very quick because when she originally showed it with the manufactured home at 315, we ended up negotiating that deal on the market, guys. It had only been on the market eight days. It hadn't even sat there that long and they had a bunch of buyers come in. The problem was nobody could get financing. So I know at 350, it's not going to be an issue because now it's been completely renovated um, and we've taken care of the issue of not being able to get financing. So, you know, we'll make stand to make Chris. I mean, maybe you have numbers in there with the cost. I mean, no, I can talk about the borrowing costs and everything, but we're anywhere. If we sell that with what we think it is after realtor costs, holding costs, everything net, probably 85 to 90,000 on that deal. On, on both the mobile home and yes, the house? Yes, correct. Okay. Yep. Which is like, we I think we closed on it September 21st. 24th. 24th. Okay. So it's been like almost two months. My goal was like to be in and out in eight weeks. And it's a, it was a nice house. I knew we mm -hmm. could do it. And we've, we've accomplished that. Yeah, that's not very, that's not a long time. Any Anyone on here that's ever renovated a house, let alone two, like that's a very short period of time. How much did you, like the money you borrowed, how much did you pay on the interest that you borrowed? Uh, so we have two different lenders on this okay. uh, pro property uh, and they each lent $150,000 and we're paying them 12% 12 12 interest. They borrowed 300K. Each one are making 12% on their money. Well, first off, like how many of you would have lent on, a, on these deals or on this deal? Would any of you have lent on this deal? 12% and it was first lien position, right? Yep. All right. So 
For Tammy, can you kind of just walk through how you structured the deal with the lenders? Yeah, absolutely. So this is really important, guys, especially if you're tuning in for the first time and, and anyone that's seen me talk on a webinar like this, I always try to get this in a, a few different times because this is this is so important. If you're going to be borrowing money, put yourself in the lender's shoes. Like what's going to make this lender feel really comfortable lending their money on, on, a, on a piece of real estate? It's the real estate. It's the collateral. So with any any time that you're doing a real borrowing money, guys, or if you're lending, we're going to ask or provide as borrowers a mortgage or a deed of trust in our in, in South Carolina. We use a mortgage, right? We're going to uh, have our attorneys draw this up. We're going to have our real estate attorney also draw up a promissory note that outlines the terms of the loan. Uh, we do all of our business within our LLC. However, we always provide personal guarantees on all of our loans, right? Yep, 12% is good, you bet. And then we list them on the insurance as the lost payee, just like a bank would want, right? So th these these documents here are, are, are critical. If you're lending, we gotta ask for this. What makes, private money lending is amazing, but what makes it great is the collateral. So think about this, the person is lending, all in all, let's just say there was one lender and they were, <coughs> and we were borrowing 300,000. Their $300,000 is secured by an asset that's worth over $400,000, right? So if, if something happens to myself or Christy and, and all these things, if we, ne if, we, if we never made a payment, then just like a bank, that person can begin the process uh, to foreclose on the property, all right? Or do a, get, the, get the property as collateral for their loan. So if you're lending money, we want to see these things each and every time and if you're borrowing funds uh, make sure that you're providing these documents to your lenders <laughs> how much are the attorney fees to get your place back well that's that's gonna that's gonna vary and it could take a long time but here's here's how you need to be thinking tammy everything that you're doing as a lender is to make sure that doesn't happen so i think sometimes you know i just said hey we pay 12 percent. we can pay upwards of 14 don't get attracted by that shiny interest rate. If you're thinking about lending, you got to make sure that you're asking the right questions. Like you're vetting not just the deal, but you're also vetting the person that's going to be the operator, the person that essentially that you're lending the money to, right? Do you believe that they're going to be able to follow through? Do they have the credibility to be able to follow through on doing this deal, on hiring the contractors, getting the work done, getting it listed? Do they do a good job of analyzing the, the projects and things like that right so everything that we do is to is to avoid all of that you know where i've seen a lot of mistakes you know outside of here is people just think oh you know there's a great interest rate and all i need is a promissory note and here's the funds and then they don't have a system they don't have documents let alone a system to keep updated with the progress of the property and things like that so these are all the different types of things that you're going to want to have as a lender and as a borrower, we should be bragging to our lenders that this is how we operate, if that makes sense. So somebody said, can they be detitled without being put on a permanent foundation? Uh, yes, actually. So this is this is kind of like another interesting thing, Jay, with permanent foundations. Most people think a mobile home um, being on a permanent foundation is actually it actually has to be bricked. That is untrue. It doesn't need brick under it. Now they'll allow many different types of skirting to go along with that. Not Most will not take the old metal skirting, but they'll take some of the newer types of skirting that they have. So yes, it can be detitled without being on foundation. It just needs to be tied down to the ground properly, which it was done. Um, and did I get the lot subdivided? Yes. So that was the, during my due diligence. The first thing was to call Calhoun County and make sure they would allow me to subdivide it but also how much land would they allow? And they said you had to have at least 0.5 acres on every piece of uh, parcel, which worked out perfect the way the land was split. So we're actually in the process. We had the survey done. They're just drafting everything so I can file it. I have a mobile home in NorCal in a senior park where each unit also owns the land. So the monthly dues are only $100. It was manufactured in 1987 and I'm wanting to sell it. That's interesting. It's okay. So you actually own the land and the house so that shouldn't be an issue and actually getting financing you find actually in california there's a lot of cash buyers so you might be able to just list that on the mls and sell it cash to be honest with you i just helped a friend sell one in orange county um, and she had a cash offer come in 
but you're actually in a good date time because what ends up happening is if a mobile home is manufactured before June 15, 1976, you can't get financing, but anything after that banks will finance. So the fact it's on the land should be actually great. You So you own the land and pay diff two different property taxes. So you might... Um, check with like someone that does mortgages in california and ask them about detitling it because i'm guessing and you can answer this in the chat box judy do you still have a title with that as well because i'm guessing you pay on the actual mobile home and then you actually pay on the land yes you do okay so you can probably detitle that and make it actually more valuable if it's if it's attached to the land or something else um okay the home is secured so you could detitle it and somebody could get financing Another idea, I would check comps in that area and see what things are selling for. Just another idea of something you could do. You could look into just selling that home off the land completely and see what you could get for that. And then maybe look at buying a new home and putting it on the land. And that might actually increase the value of what you could resell that for if there was like a brand new home on the land. It might not. It just depends on what the comps are pulling for. Cool. Or just keep it. If you're making good money, I'm guessing maybe you have it as a rental. Maybe it's an amazing passive income. Maybe you don't want to get rid of it. Yeah, Tammy was saying, I saw a disclosure listed that you can't advertise in certain states. Can you clarify what that means? So you can rent it currently, and how do you detitle? So you would actually, in California, where it's a little different, like everything, I know California has some different rules and regulations. Here, I can go to the DMV to detitle. Um, you would just get with um, an attorney, and they can detitle it for you. I think ours, uh, the last one that we did was like $595 to have that done for us. So in California, it'll be 5095 No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll make double, so. Chris, was that a question you were asking us? I'm sorry. I, I think well, no, I think, I think what Tammy's talking about is she's probably talking about like when you first go to PMC, <clears throat> let's see if I can't find it. Um, there's the excluded states. So like they go into PMC and, you know, they're going to register. Let's see. Now join. I think she's talking maybe about there's 16 states, only borrowers were excluded from posting on the deals page. So if I go in here, there we go, go to deals. Like in here, if you wanted to post a deal, basically your deal would be, you know, if you were in one of those states, you can't post the deal. Basically now, because the site is totally free, those rules don't apply. That was back when they were a membership. We keep that up there because the new rollout in April will not have that. But you see here, all these deals, this one here, right here, Florida, St. Pete, Florida. You'll probably remember, Tammy, that Florida was one of the excluded states. You couldn't post in Florida. But here it is. You know, Jason Matthews has got a deal posted in Florida. So how can that be if it's excluded? Well, it's because the site's changed and we've evolved. We're just leaving it on there until we go to the new site, just from a legal standpoint. But you can post deals in this section in any state no ifs, ands, or buts, because everybody can be part of this. The, these can be free or paid members in here. Yeah, and on the lender side, it, it doesn't make any difference. So yeah. no worries on that. Yeah, so if you're a lender, none of that matters. Your real estate business lives and dies by the network and the connections that you make. I mean, after all, your network, well, it's your net worth. That's what you always heard, right? If that's an area where you desire improvement, well, Private Money Club, it's for you. PMC saves you precious time and money by bringing the real estate world, well, right to you, right in the palm of your hand. So get in on the action like so many others have by going to privatemoneyclub.com and sign up. You offer a deal on taking both PMC, oh. Yeah, so we do, <clears throat> and Linda. Um, so what you wanna do is just dial 1-833-JOIN-PMC or um, you can just schedule a call real quick. There should be openings later today or tomorrow with our team and they have all the combination discounts that they can hook you up with. So I'll put that in the um, chat box for you. And one thing, I just wanna do a quick recap of your deal. Sorry, I lost my pretty pictures, but I'm, I'm gonna go here so they can see the screen. Um, you know, on that deal, you know, it's 12%, two different lenders. Now, Noah and Christy, just while I'm kind of talking this through, you had two lenders. So a lot of what people would think, well, one must be first position and one must be second because you can't have two in first, right? You can, you can. Um, in this in this particular deal, I do have a first and second, and yeah. and reason being, Chris, is we funded the deal, and then we were fully capable, willing, and going to fund the rest with our own cash. But because uh, Private Money Club working so well, darn it, uh, I just had people continuing to call me and ask me, 
can I lend on this deal? Can I lend on this deal? Can I lend on this deal? And I found value with a particular lender. I was like, you know what? I really want to work with this person because she, she has some experience. I've actually coached her. She was in my coaching accelerator program. One of the first ones that we did. And I could see the value in doing long-term business with this person. So that's when I said, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll add you to the, to the deal and, and I'm, but you're going to be in a second position. She said, that's fine. There's so much equity. Um, not, I'm not worried about it. And was that because you already had a first position? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this was probably two or three weeks after uh, we had closed on the property and done the paperwork and things gotcha. like that. But, but just if we were to go back and redo that, let's just say, I, I don't, I'm going to make this up folks. This isn't what really happened, but let's just say there was, you know, they needed 300 and they posted it on PMC and there was two people that, you know, were interested in the deal, but each only had 150 of the 300. Each one of them in, in its state specific, but this is what Noah teaches in the accelerator. Each one could have been a first position on the mortgage. So a lot of people don't think that can be done, but if it's done at the same time, it certainly can. So although this one wasn't that, this one was a first and a second, it was more because of timing. This person came in, grabbed the first position. This person asked if they could lend on it, but all that was available was a second. So second yep. position just means you're under, you're behind this person. So if you're ever going to be second lien, you want to make sure that this property has enough equity to support that. So if they sold this property or fire sold this property, is there enough equity to pay this person and give you all of your 150 back? Obviously, we know the numbers on this. It was 355. Was that just the house at 355? Just that. Yeah, that's what we're going to be listing the house at. And we're going to be mm -hmm. listing the manufactured home, at, I believe, 120. Mm -hmm. right? at 120. Right. So I think all of you can do the math. Now you got 475,000 bucks. You're more than covered. Plus... If, even in that case, you know, I haven't seen your guys' personal guarantee, but they got a personal guarantee. So he always teaches this like a bank. Okay. Just, just mimic a bank is what we always say. You know, there's never been, I don't think a time where a bank has lent money on a property and not had a mortgage or deed of trust on the property. So that's always first. This is, you know, what I would call security. This is how you literally securitize the property or the loan that you're doing. This is why when your financial advisor or any financial advisor says all oh, that private lending stuff is so risky, you literally just got to say, stop, hold on a second. Where's the risk? Oh, well, blah, 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 blah. Hold on. I got a property worth, you know, two properties worth $475,000 and I lent 150. So please, like, even if things fall apart, even if it goes to foreclosure, even if all hell breaks loose, like, where's my risk? And, and, you know, what are they going to answer? I don't know, but the only risk there is time. You got to wait. Like in worst case scenario, the worst case scenario that happens is you got to wait. Now, if, if both of these people were in first position, let's just change this. The best outcome that these lenders could have is that Noah and Christy don't pay them and they foreclose and take this property. Like literally, like I, I don't need to do the math for you but you're gonna make a heck of a lot more. And even if it took you 12 months, 16 months to foreclose and get the property, you're, you're pretty freaking good. So that's the power of the security. The promissory note realistically is just gonna spell out the terms. It's like the rules of engagement. Um, I mean, they can be very simple. They can be very complex. Your attorney can draft it, the borrower's attorney. I know Noah and Christy have their own uh, promissory note that they use. So usually if I'm lending to somebody, like Noah and Christy, they would send me their documentation. Chris Rude does this all the time. He sends me the note. He sends me the mortgage. I literally have my attorney do a quick review of it. I mean, it probably takes the attorney 10 minutes. Seriously. Goes through, make sure I'm not missing something. Second set of eyes. Comes back over. And I don't, as a lender, I don't even sign it. I just say, yeah, these will work. And then they sign it. So as the lender, I don't sign the documents. So the lender doesn't sign the mortgage, clearly, because the lender's not promising anything. The lender's just putting money up. So no one, Christie would sign the mortgage. Okay. The, the promissory note, it's the terms and who sets the terms. Well, the borrower and the lender together, or, I mean, push come to shove the lender. Cause thou with the gold makes the rules. So right. essentially like these rules or these terms on the promissory note can be solely derived by the lender because that's, who's got the money, the lost payee, same thing. There's a reason why you've probably never been able to buy a house and not have a homeowner's insurance policy with a mortgage on it, you have to. Why? Because the bank, you know, like a bank, 
The bank does not want to go after you when your house burns down because you forgot to shut the burners off, right? The, the bank wants the insurance company to stroke them a check because they know that Noah and Christy just lost their house, probably not going to have 150 or 300,000 bucks just to write a check. They're going through hard times. So you want the insurance company to write the check in that. And the personal guarantee, I almost sometimes say, this is like cherry on the top. Like this is very rare, but this is where the good borrowers will put up or shut up. Because now if all hell goes loose, the property gets foreclosed on and there's not enough to cover this person's. I mean, in this one there is, but let's just erase this and just say that it's only 355 and you lend 300. Let's just say the value of the property goes down. Now it's worth 275 and you foreclose and you fire sell it at 275. So if you're both in first, now you're short by 25 grand plus the interest. So with a personal guarantee, now what you're doing is you're coming and knocking and you're saying, hey, guess what? We had to fire sale that property at 275. You owe us some money and they can go after their personal assets. Okay, and, and that would hold up in court. A personal guarantee will hold up in court. It's why banks always ask you for a personal guarantee. So this, this is not complicated. And, I, and it also lays out how you protect yourself as a lender, but also you're protecting the borrower too. These are both protecting each other. A lot of, bar, a lot of real estate investors will skip the insurance because they're trying to save a buck and then something bad happens and it's a complete total loss and it devastates them. So this is this kind of here by the lender requiring that is actually good for the, the borrower and the lender because it holds them both accountable. And I always like, listen, I said this to Rob Fuller once, you know, Rob was he's a very uh, big developer, a couple, I don't know, well in the excess of a hundred million dollars in, in assets on their personal guarantee. And I, and I said to him, I said, so Rob, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, buddy, but like you guys have kind of gotten there. You're at that place where you can go to any bank, any financial institution and do a non-recourse loan. Like the bank, like will give you money and you do not have to personally guarantee it anymore. And he knows this. So I said, so why do you offer a personal guarantee to all lenders that lend on your deals? And you know what his answer was? It was so simple and, and, and literally just kind of logical. He said, because it keeps us on our game so that if we screw up, we're going to have to lose what we've built. And that's not, that's not acceptable. So it keeps them in the game. You know, it, it's not like, you know, because listen, like here's some things all lenders need to know. And borrowers, you probably don't want your lenders to know this. But at the end of the day, like I'm going to pick on you guys. Noah and Christy could buy this property in an LLC. They could literally go to their attorney, set up an LLC. And the only thing the LLC owns are these properties, right? So they get into the project and you know every wall you open up, everything you turn, there's more bad news. And they're just like, you know, piss on this. They borrowed 300 grand in this LLC. There's no personal guarantee. And Noah and Christy, you know, aren't who Noah and Christy are, but let's just say they're bad people. And they're like, I'm done. I don't care. I'm going to walk. So they literally walk from the deal. They stop returning the lender's calls. All goes to hell and handbag. All this stuff's in place except for this. What are you going to be able to go after as the lender? You can go after the entity, but there's, you know, you could go after the, the borrowers that walked, but there's no personal guarantee. So really you can only go after whatever the entity has. And if this is what the entity has, that's what you're going to get. So by adding that personal guarantee, you're basically making sure that that borrower is on the hook. And the only other thing I always tell people is don't just accept a personal guarantee and be like, oh, wow, will you personally guarantee it? Great. Because, you know, the borrower says, great, we'll personally guarantee it. And then you're like, oh, now I feel so much better. But wait a second. What, are this, what does their personal financial statement look like? What are they personally guaranteeing it with? And then you get their personal financial statement. It says cash and bank, 100 bucks, 401k, zero, brokerage accounts, zero, life insurance term, uh, network, assets, 100 bucks, liabilities, $10 million, you know, it, I'm making this up, but like, is that a personal guarantee that has any merit or any weight? Zero. So you got to go that extra step and just review the documents. And in another step, I'll give you another little pointer. And Noah teaches all this, but we're kind of giving you this stuff for free, but you, you go much more in depth. On a personal guarantee, if somebody says cash on hand, let's just say a hundred thousand bucks. Now, some of you might be like, oh, cool. They got a hundred grand. Me? I'd be like, prove it send me your bank statement, take a screenshot. Let me see 
behind the curtains. Kind of like, you know, like I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> That's what I would do. So I don't know. No, what do you what do, what do you say about that stuff? There, I, I think one of the, one of the most valuable things is is operating with that you inspect what you expect, Chris. Like what people tell you, you know, you don't just take it for face value. You ask for the proof. This is part of that due diligence process of you know underwriting a deal and underwriting the borrower. So if someone says, "Hey, this property is worth three fifty, okay, great. I want to see proof. And, and another thing too, that I always say is, you know, <clears throat> in private money club, like looking through here, I'm just, I'm kind of just on here browsing through some of the newest deals that are posted. I mean, there's some really experienced borrowers on here and let's just say a brand new lenders on here, Noah, and they're looking at a deal and I'm not going to say anyone, but like this one, you're here. Like I know these guys, they're, they're incredibly, incredibly experienced. So a lender for the first time looks at this deal, it's 30 grand, it's 12%. And folks, you guys can all go to privatemoneyclub.com and look at the deal. It's the second deal in. And, and they could be like, oh my God, this is great. They start communicating with the borrower. Now the borrower is incredibly sophisticated. The lender is brand new and isn't sophisticated. I'm not saying this would happen, but the borrower could literally kind of strong arm, I guess would be the word, the lender to saying, oh, we've done 10,000 deals and we have this much money and all this and and wow the, the lender and then get the lender to do kind of what the borrower wants. Now, that probably can happen and probably does happen. But I'll tell you who it doesn't happen to. It doesn't happen to the members of PMC that go through the accelerator coaching. Because yeah. after you're done with the accelerator coaching, whether you're a lender or borrower, brand new or done 10,000 deals, you come out of that with confidence, knowing exactly what you're going to do. So you meet with somebody like, you know, a really experienced borrower who's trying to star strong old arm you. And you're just like, hey, listen, I know you think I don't know what I'm talking about, but here's what you're going to give me. You're going to give me X, Y, Z. I'm going to have all this. And if I don't have it by tomorrow, you can find somebody else to borrow money from. Now, at that point, that borrower could be like, whoa, okay, I guess I thought I thought I had the upper hand, but they cower. And now all of a sudden they give you everything you want. You got to be in control, folks. You know, we constantly are telling you, take back control of your money which you can't take back control of your money without the knowledge of how to do that with confidence. The accelerator coaching program gives you the confidence because it lays it all out. I mean, like Tess is a perfect example and there's many more on here, but like Tess, like she'd run your ass over if you were trying to like pull one <laughs> on her or pull a strong arm. It's because she's gone through the course. She's got the confidence. She knows what she's talking about. But Tess, not too long ago, when she first got around the campfire, didn't know anything. It never lent money. Came from corporate America and literally probably, Tess, correct me if I'm wrong, probably thought that private lending was the riskiest thing there ever was because their financial advisor said so. I don't know, Tess, I'm making some of that up, but probably not too far from the truth and probably not far from the truth for a lot of the folks on here. Yeah, it's about three, you know, I, we, we talk about this. It's right on the website there. It's about three things with you know, feeling empowered. It's about credibility. A lot of people know that private money lending is a great way to make money and to borrow money, but they feel like maybe I don't have the experience or this is my first time or I've only done it a handful of times and got whatever it is. Uh, clarity, right? It, the steps to take, just like we're talking about here today, just you want to feel good about it. How do you feel good about it? You get, get the education, you work with someone, you have someone help you that knows what they're doing. And if you have those two things then the confidence comes and we can repeat the process and do this over and over again. So um, those of those students who have taken the accelerator program have all graduated with those three things, uh, credibility, clarity, and confidence. And if you're thinking, gosh, I think this is something that I want to, to have or do or feel good about, then, um, you know, I look forward to working with you next week. I really do. Yeah. It's and there's two, component, there's two components here too. So some of you are like, hey, I want to learn how to be a lender or borrower and others are like, you know, hold on a second. That mobile home stuff sounded really cool that Christy was talking about. So, you know, we put both of them up there. These are what we we talked about, you know, this weekend at the three day training and because it was so well received and because it's just so different with the mobile home stuff. And, and literally this is kind of like the dynamic duo. Like you get both really. I mean, I know you, you know, he's doing the accelerator and she's doing the mobile home, but really you get one and the other. And, and, and listen, I don't know this to be fact. So I guess I'm, I'm going to maybe put my foot in my mouth, but Noah, has 
Have, do you have any students that have gone through Accelerator that you have then allowed to lend on Christie's mobile home deals? Because maybe that's what I need to do. Maybe I need to pay to go through the Accelerator so I can finally get a freaking deal to lend to you guys on. Because every time I ask, you're like, oh, that one's already funded. Oh, that one's already gone. <laughs> well, Sorry, if, but maybe next time. Like, it, has I, I, it does help, Chris. It does help. <laughs> Listen, and, and because you'll be working with both of us at the end, we make you take a survey of who you like better and who has a better smile. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> wow, that's hitting below the belt. <laughs> We're competitive here at the Harris House. Yeah, we so, are. We yeah. are. No, I, I love it. I mean, I, I, you have to know what you're doing. Everything you said, Chris, is why we're part of PMC. I've coached so many students over my lifetime that didn't know what they were doing, right? Or they didn't, they didn't take a class. They just read something. Oh, here's how I should secure my money. And then all of a sudden they stopped getting the phone call on certain things. And I'm like, why would you not consult someone to find out if you did everything properly? Well, I don't know. I just trusted them. They said they'd done a hundred deals. So sad. So ed again, education, it comes back to everything, but the mobile homes I love because you can lend on them, but then people that start to lend on them start to see these aren't as scary as single family homes and they make great money. Maybe I need to pick up a couple. So you need to know what to do with them. Not only that, like they're, they're a lower price point. Yeah. So like there's a lot of folks like, I, and I'm sure there's some on here. There's a lot of folks that just, they want to get in the game, but they, they can't get in at $300,000 or, you know, 150, maybe they've only got 20, $30,000. They want to play ball. They're like, coach, put me in the game. Come on. Well, now exactly. you got the mobile home parks. You can put them in the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, here's another I mean, price thing. points. Give them some price points. For some reason. Yeah. yeah um, so ones, price yeah. Ones we purchased in a park, $6,000. One we purchased that we're actually buying, we're going to flip it to someone that has land to put it on $11,000, right? Some were buying a home on land, $30,000, $50,000. So, I mean, these are all numbers. I'm sure everyone's going, I've got a policy with that just sitting there. I've got money that I couldn't do anything with. I didn't know what. This is the opportunity. But again, you have to know what you're lending on and what the heck you're doing. You, I mean, we're great. I love us. You love us, right? But that doesn't matter. You need to pretend like you don't know anything about us and you need to know every single detail of what to do and how to comp the deal and how to look at it. That's so important. I can't enforce that enough. So you just hit on something that's so vitally important. And me and Steven talk about this all the time. You know, if you're using the infinite banking concept and you're, you've got your policy, you're sending your policy out to pay off debts, buy cars, lend, that money is coming back into your policy every single month. So it's not long before all of a sudden you've got five, six, ten thousand dollars in there. And then you're looking at that five, six, ten thousand, you're like, I know I need to get that money working because it's being lazy and I don't want it to be lazy cash, but I there's nothing that I can move five to ten grand on. But like that's where these mobile home parks come in. You know, it gives you that opportunity to to move smaller dollar amounts into deals and get that small dollar amount working so that they, that small dollar amount can produce babies and then send the babies to work. 100%. No babies I think were that's harmed so cute. In, the, in the making of this video. <laughs> we're talking about little no baby babies. dollars. Little baby dollars. It's this awesome is great, place. man. I just love this community. Someone just said that in the text there, it's about relationships, and it absolutely is. If anything, you know, you guys, if you want to be great at something, uh, you want to be better than 95% of the people out there, then if you can dedicate 18, 20 minutes a day towards your craft, and, and it sounds like everyone on this call, their our craft is money. Right, whether it's mobile homes, whether it's lending, it's 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 learning as much as we can about financial education. And if you want to accelerate that, I look forward to working with you guys and building some relationships with, with each and every one of you that take this this class with me or Christy, because I'll we it is a two for one. When we sit around at the dinner table, we talk about our students and and what deals y'all got going on, and and it really is a pretty cool thing. So I just love the Private Money Club and what y'all continue to do and build. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you uh, in the next couple of weeks here. So thanks guys. So, all right. So this is, <clears throat> you know, folks, a lot of you probably have ideas and sometimes the best thing to do with your ideas and, you know, different things that you think about while you're showering at night or going for a run or whenever you get those crazy ideas is just to put them out in the universe. And Steven's super good at this. And, and one day he's like, Chris, 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 I got this great idea. He's like, why don't we create a private club? And I'm like, Stephen, we already got one of those. It's private money club. It's it is a private club of lenders and borrowers. He's like, no, 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 no. I mean, like a private club. Think like a country club or like an elite club. Stephen loves like you know, like Stephen will like take it a flight to nowhere 
just so that he gets bumped up to the medallion or to the diamond. Like he's one flight away from a diamond. He's he's just flying somewhere. He's going to get off the plane. He's going to be like, this is a cool airport. He's going to be like, where's my flight back? All right, <laughs> I'm now diamond. So like he's part of the club, right? I'm yeah, totally but- joking. He didn't do that. But he had this idea and I want to just bounce it off. And I've been doing some work on the legal side and I'm doing more tonight of like creating this private club. It'd be a membership club. So there'd be like a membership you got to pay. Let's say it's a hundred bucks a month. I don't, whatever, just throwing a number out there. The only reason you pay the membership club is because you get cool perks for that. But that's your, that's how you become part of the membership. And you sign like a contract that you're part of a club, an exclusive club. And there's things you can't talk about. You know, what happens in fight club stays in flight fight club. We don't talk about fight club. But inside that club, what we then have the ability to do, and just hear me out, this is totally spitballing, is we have the ability to put people like Christy and Noah in the club as opportunity people. And we can bring these elites in where literally only the members of this club have have the option to get into these opportunities. But then think about this. I literally just read a whole thing about this, and I don't know all the specifics, but inside of a membership club, Okay, what could be done, because it's got to be membership and it's got to be exclusive and there's contracts and legal. What we could do is create a trust where each member that comes into this club becomes a trustee or maybe that's not the right word, but they become a member of this trust. Okay, and what this trust can do is pool funds. Okay, so we can pool money. So every member has the ability and there'd be minimums and maximums. So let's just say the minimum buy in is is 20 and and the max is 1 million. Everybody has the ability to put money into this. And then there's bookkeeping over here that tracks everybody's amount that they put in. And then as a collective group, one time a month, we basically do like a a meeting of the membership and we look at opportunities. Stephen, think like Inicio, this is kind of what we did as a group. And we let's just say the pool of money is 2 million bucks. We basically go out and we find opportunities Let's say then Noah and Christy are in here and they've got a deal. We basically make Noah and Christy sign an agreement that these that we have first right of refusal for for whatever deals, right? And we do the same thing with the Fullers. Like, you know, we go to the Fullers and we say, hey, our group, our private group has first right of refusal for first position, direct to deal, you know, things on this project, a fully sold out project. And we just, you know, we work with different people and we can we can find these different opportunities like the forklifts, like a lot of people want the forklifts, but there's just never any forklifts because Steven and all his cronies buy all the forklifts. And then Joe heard about it and then game over. Like I'm just now getting my second damn forklift and I'm the one that started the thing and I had to wait. And then I get people saying, oh, I talked to Ark and he said, you know, I need X amount of dollars or I can't get into one. It's it's not that you need X amount of dollars. It's that he's only got bigger lifts because everybody else bought the other ones. But we work with someone like the forklifts where we have first exclusive. So you kind of get where I'm going with this. None of this is done right now, folks, but I'm just saying like we pull it together and it gives us buying power. So now instead of going to the fork, going to the Fullers and saying, Hey, I got a hundred grand. Can I get into the Fullers? We're going to the Fullers and saying, Hey, we're going to place a million dollars as a collective group. We want 15%. So you literally just got a 3% raise or we go to the, you know, we go to them and, you know, we say Noah and Christy, you know, we, we want 14%, but we'll fund all of your deals, you know, and we basically can use the buying power of this trust of this membership to basically get higher returns, better positioning, first lien positions. And then what we also can do into the trust, into the membership is we can bring in like underwriters. So anyone that comes in, because part of the, the membership, you have access to a personal underwriter. And we basically underwrite all the deals collectively with a professional underwriter, Brandon here, who under he's mortgage broker and did underwriting for the bank. So you you basically can put all sorts of these ancillary services, legal services. So if anybody wanted, you know, legal services, right? I mean, you can you can bolt on all these things into this membership. I don't know, Stephen. I haven't stopped thinking about this since you said it. What are your thoughts on this, Christy, Stephen? And then we'll ask the group of what everybody thinks of it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I mean, this go. is your idea, right? Let's go, man. Yeah, Let's... same. I think it's great. This is the only thing I've been researching. And I have a call with our SEC attorney this afternoon about this. And I'm going to mention this and say, is this possible? I don't want to create a fund. Okay. Because it, it just, I just don't want that. I want this to be more personal than a fund. I want this to be like, 
fund. Everybody, everybody their grandma has a fund these days. No, fund. I know. I don't want a fund. I just don't want a fund. And attorneys are always quick to try to get you to do a fund because it's thirty grand, and I don't know. It's just it's a fund. There's just with that said, I do have a couple of funds, but let's just stick with the investment club, right? So, what does everybody think of this? Is this is this something people would do? Because there's going to be some rules of engagement. This isn't going to be open to the public. Like you're going to have to be a premier member in PMC, and I can guarantee you to be part of this membership, you will have had to have gone through the accelerator coaching because we don't want any we don't want any people in here not knowing what they're doing. So, like what we'd probably do is the membership would be like a monthly amount, but it would include the accelerator coaching. So it would have like an initial buy-in. Think like a, a membership to a country club. Like there's an initial buy-in and then X amount per month is your dues. It'd be like that. But the initial buy-in, you know, whatever that would be, would get you like whatever trainings we decide that you need. It would include them all in a bundle. And then the membership would just be an ongoing due. It would certainly pay for itself. See, we got, I didn't know we had Jimmy on here. Jimmy would probably know the rules around the trust and how you could do that. And if he doesn't, like I'll find out tonight, but I don't know. See, see sometimes folks, and, and all of you should be doing this in your life. When you get a cool idea, just put it out in the universe. It might be the stupidest thing. And you know, some of you might be like, that is the dumbest effing thing I've ever seen in my life. You guys are dreaming dumb shit up, you know, but like, how are you ever going to know that if you don't ask? So I don't know. Super. Hey, listen, somebody thought the Snuggie was a good idea and look at all the people that bought it and he was a millionaire, right? Put the ideas out there. You never know. Absolutely. <laughs> How about the Pet Rock, right? Pet Rock in, in uh, I think it was WTF today. Like, let's go back to the 80s. Any of you that are, you know, like like me old, uh, you know, from the 80s or even older. Like, you remember drinking from a, a, a hose, like in a hot summer day, like you're super thirsty from playing and you just you just go turn the hose on. You wait for a little bit of the cold water and you're just feasting on hose water. You know, parents don't even let their kids drink from hoses anymore. Oh my God, you're going to get sick. There's parasites. I just read an article and you're going to have like these worms and intestines eating your body from the inside out. I don't know what, why we're not dead. Like with the things we did as a kid. But what I'm trying to say is like somebody literally said one day, I'm going to put water in a bottle. And I guarantee you all of us, from the eighties that drank out of hoses, like that's water. Like when I'm thirsty, I drink from the hose. I drink from the faucet. And this idiot thinks he's going to put that in a bottle and sell it. What a dumbass! I'll, I'll never forget when I actually heard that they were bottling water and selling it. And I'm like, well, that must just be for like camping and stuff. Like, you know, I, and I think back then it was, and now it's like, people don't even drink from the faucet. That's, and that's not good for you. It's bad. Yeah. Uh, Morgan, it would definitely be inside PMC hundred percent. It'd be like a private club inside private money club. Yep. That, that's definitely, it wouldn't be a standalone. How is voting done in terms of lending decisions? I, I, I wish I had all the answers. I don't know. Uh, we'd come up with a process and a procedure. I'd probably have Brandon do that. And uh, then every time when we'd find an opportunity, we'd basically post the opportunity to a private group, like a Slack group. And then everybody basically could do, you know, vote on it. And then there'd be a final thing every single month, the same day, same time every month where, you know, nobody's got to get on a Zoom or anything. If you're busy, it would just basically be a Slack chat and we would get, do a vote. And if there's 50 members, we need a certain percentage of, of people to vote to basically push it through to the next level. And then, you know, I, I, you could even have something where some people are like, hey, I'll, I'll do this, but, you know, I don't want my money used for X, these kind of things. There's a lot more to it than just this, but it's just, that's just an idea. And if that doesn't work, we'll, uh, we'll figure out another way to structure it. Uh, see, I was always wondering what was wrong with Chris Ash. And that explains it. He drank water from the hose during the seventies. You know, I always knew there was something wrong with that guy. <laughs> All right. Any more questions, folks? What we want to really do is just kind of lay out the things. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit more about your, your mobile home course as we wrap? It starts yeah. Sunday, right? Yeah, it starts Sunday. So it's going to be Sunday and Thursday, guys. Everything is recorded. Um, I actually wrote a course on mobile home investing. That's where I came up with the challenge. I felt like everybody can do the course, but until sometimes you're pushed and held accountable, you're not actually going to go out and do something. So I created the challenge and we've done a couple now and I, I enjoy it because it gets people moving. It gives you weekly achievable action items. It's live, but in case you can't make that, because I know everybody has a busy life, we record every session, so you have that to go back on. And what I talk about is marketing to find homes, how to fund them, where to find the deals, 
all everything literally from A to Z, how to build relationships in parks, how to wholesale them, how to renovate them, what what do you use to renovate? What does that look like? And then I go through the process from A to Z in four weeks. So I feel confident that period, you can do a deal once you leave there. And if you don't want to do a deal, that's okay too. You'll know what it takes to do a deal and you're able to fund them. So you know the proper guidelines and what to look for. So that that's it. I try to make it easy, right? Simple. Keep it simple. I think that's the, the biggest thing, like achievable action items. Then we meet up with the Q&A. So I take all the questions out of it because I want to make sure you have zero questions, zero fear, and you can move forward to the next one. Love so it. we'll start Sunday. And we like to have fun, most importantly. I mean, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine that's probably a really fun coaching session there, especially with you. And then no, I know he's always fun, but the two of you, shoo -wee. Absolutely. Get, we get love it, guys. Lively. And we love helping people and just but just bringing opportunity. That's why we love being part of this. Just like when you're talking about, let's build this fun. Let's do this. You know, I mean, all of this is so great because you're right. Without one idea, if in 2007, I wasn't like, mobile homes are great things. People were like, no, they're not. I heard that constantly. They're awful investments. Why are you doing it? And now full circle, everyone's like, I wish I would have done these 20 years ago. So don't be that person. Absolutely. And then just as we close, folks, one thing I'd love to do is I always like to help the people in our community and in our campfire. And, and a lot of you, I know that some of you are maybe have debts you want to pay off. Uh, maybe some of you have heard me talk a little bit about what I'm doing where in literally, uh, it's uh, before 2027. So what, what is that? I'm um, going 2024, 25, 26. In three years, I'm paying off my mortgage, which I just took out two years ago. Two years ago, I took out a, a call it $700,000, 30-year fixed mortgage, and I'm paying it off in three years. And I'm not going to work any harder to do that. I don't really have to do anything. I don't have to save any more money. Literally, it's it's a system that I learned from Christy Van on Fantastic. So stay tuned. But I'd I'd love to then tell all of you to go to Christy Van's her YouTube channel, which is Fantastic. I'll put it in the chat and just watch some of her stuff. It's velocity banking and velocity banking and infinite banking are tied at the hips. Literally, they both use the velocity of money. So I'd urge anyone that you know really is thinking that that would be really hard to do to pay your mortgage off in three years to go to her site. And, and, and watch the videos because not only does she show you how to pay houses off, but cars and debts and everything. And it's using the velocity of money. So check out Vantastic. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of work with Christy and I uh, wanted to give that a shout out while we're here. And also check out Noah and, and Christy's stuff, but you get to do that by just joining and showing up on Sunday and then on Monday for the accelerator. Steven, anything else you want to call out? Morgan's selling forklifts. What do you got going, Morgan? Great. Now he's got them too. He got a forklift. Oh, for he, he's got a forklift for me. Well, it's not for me. It's call Ark and get the forklift, and I'll just buy it. Yeah. yeah. I don't want any forklifts in my driveway. I don't have any more room. There's too many cars as there is. I kind of uh, want one just for like a month to help me do Christmas lights, so it can raise me up. I can put the lights, and it lays me down. Dude, in the newest video I did, like I'm on a, on one of those scissor lift things. You would yeah. love that. Like you just get in this little basket, and you got a joystick, and you just go up. Dude, those things go high. And then you kind of look down, you're like, whoa, it's, you're kind of like, this is high. But I, uh, my God. <laughs> I was my literally God. like, where's the video you test driving this forklift? That's what I want to see now. <laughs> I can't wait for the day where like some of the folks on here, probably Joe, instead of having lawn ornaments out in your front yard, you're going to have forklifts painted like, you know, Buffalo Bills colors. And you know how they have the buffaloes out in there? Like you're just going to see forklifts and then you're going to be like, oh, he's got one too. That's going to be a thing of the future. Anyway, with that being said, folks, thanks so much for joining us for another week of Wealth Webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a few things in it. And the best part about it is I hope you laughed. And uh, we will see you this afternoon at 4.30 for Ask Me Anything. But until then, have a good day. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. We're putting up tons of them. But I think if you like this one, you'll probably like that video as well. Not only that, I've got a book that I created, Mapping Out the Millionaire Mystery, where we actually show you what the wealthy do in the game they play with money. I want you to have that for free. And if you wanna know about all my new videos coming up, click that alert button, actually smash that alert button, and you'll be notified every time we put a new video. So we'll see you on the next episode.